Hi, this is Reg Atwal and welcome to another episode on our channel. We have an awesome entrepreneur with us today, serial entrepreneur, parallel entrepreneur, multiple businesses. He's been through an unbelievable journey. And as you can see on the screen share, multiple books, a secret millionaire blueprint. I've got one of those in my library at the back there. He's created digital products, a global coaching program. He's been on many stages and that is Arfin Khan, who's a world renowned peak performance strategist, speaker, best-selling author and entrepreneur. Moreover, he's helped create in, in 49 countries now, which is amazing, over 25 years, he's personally helped transform many people's lives. In fact, over a million people now have had exposure with his product, his experience. He's a humble guy when it comes to who he is. So I'm the one who's bigging him up right now, but he has a vision and this serious mission in life that he wants to provide tools and strategies that everyone needs out there to unleash their potential, achieve their goals, achieve their desires. So on that note, we get a chance to interview the real Arfreen Khan, a celebrity. Welcome to the show. And thank you thank very, you very much, much for being with us in your residence so much, during lockdown in India. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh for having me on your on your on your show I really really appreciate it. I feel we go back a, 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 you know a long way and there's only a few people in the world that I uh, know from probably 30 years ago and you're one of them you know being uh, young adults getting into an entrepreneurial journey and then yeah. both seeing each other blossom you know over the last 30 years yeah. and absolutely crazy. I've got loads of questions so I'm going to I'm going to get started because I can't wait. Go go ahead. All go right. ahead. So one of the things that I always talk about with next-gen entrepreneurs or people have family business legacies is the influence parents have on us or grandparents. And uh, I've, you know, I've met your father many, many years ago, and I, and I want to know, how did he influence you? And, and who else in the extended family influenced you the most as you were growing up? Sure. So that's a great question. It's my favorite question because you know, every time I do seminars or I'm talking on TV or anything like that, I'm always telling people my greatest influence in my, in my life is my family. There's absolutely no question about it. So I'll tell you what my father did and my, my mother did. It was interesting. Now I realize what they did. At that time, I didn't realize what they were doing. But we, we, we had a philosophy home that we would have at the dining table at 9 p.m. no matter what. 9 p.m. was dinner. If you turned up late, you would get no food. <laughs> so everyone would always sit on the table. Yeah. And in that convers in the, on that table, there was always stories being told about my relatives, about famous people, about this, about that. And I realized that over years, if I look at it, it was all about sharing great stories that would make us feel very powerful. That's lovely. And number two, he was very strict. Strict meaning deadlines. Nine means nine, eight means eight, ten means eight. Ten, uh, and when we were younger, uh, we go to school. After school, he would take us to his business, take us to his workplace, and we would be there. We would be involved from day one, watching him do his business or talk to people. And I think just that being in that environment, he's always told us, be self-employed, be self-employed, be self-employed, be self-employed, and told us the pain of being employed that he had at least. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you feel he was already conditioning you from a young age? Do, do I think he did what? He was conditioning you in a positive way from Yeah, no, no, no question about it. I, I don't know whether he realized he was doing it. That's a different story. Mm. Uh, I think by nature, I think he's a very positive man anyway. You know, very go-getter. Like, for example, if I, if I would cut myself uh, uh, while playing, he would say, get up. I'm not picking up. Get up yourself. So I'd get up myself. Now, we were giving paper rounds and delivering leaflets when we were 10, 11 years old. We were selling pens at school when I was 15. I was selling pens. Just, so there's always been that kind of desire. Having said that, my school had a traumatic effect on me because I was bullied at school. So on the one side, I'm very confident about want to do something. On the other side, I was really scared to talk to people. A very quiet guy, very kind of... Sh Even when you met me many, many years ago, I don't know if you remember, I wasn't very loud. I was kind of very yeah, quiet. Yeah, absolutely. I remember even when you got into the, the speaking side, originally it was like, you know, you, you were a bit uncomfortable. You even used oh. to say that you weren't a great speaker. And now, yes. look, at you, and now look at you. <laughs> And, and, and don't forget, Reg, at school, I failed my English three times, my mathematics. I even stayed an extra year for my A-levels because I was from them. Mm. And that gave me that conditioning that uh, made me kind of start doubting my, who I was as a person. Mm. But what changed it, again, was my family and hanging around with the right kind of people. Because I think, as I say to everyone, the biggest hack in success transformation 
is not the knowledge you're going to get from reading a book. Mm. It's going to be the people you hang out with. Right. It's as simple as that. And I, and, and I believe that. It doesn't mean you have to go to hang around with rich people. It doesn't mean that. You've got to hang around with like, truly amazing people. Mm. Now, what happens, mean you what happens, Arifin, where if, if, you know where we say we're only as good as the people we surround ourselves with. So do you find for some people, you know, you have to do that in stages because you may want to hang out with uh, uh, billionaires, uh, but they don't want to speak to you at this stage, okay? I'm talking maybe from a wealth point of view. It could be health, it could be okay. any area of our life. So I'm going to give everyone the biggest and the most incredible hack in, to get into any, any influential group in the world. And, and, and this is not fluff. This is not some motivational speech. I don't believe in positive thinking. I think that's shit as well. But what I'm saying is this. The fastest way to get into any group is to write a book. Simple. Because when the moment you become an author, people listen to you. And people are going to say, what do I write a book about? I'm saying write a book about write the worst book on earth. Mm. Write anything, but write a book. The moment you become an author, you'll be shocked how people will treat you and how people will... And secondly, you'll, be, you'll remain in history. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll pass away, but your books will remain. And I would, so what I, I, did would, is, I would add to that, Arfin, if it's okay, where, you know, jointly sure. we can give value to our viewers, is I, you know, I've been through six big, uh, book projects, and the first one was simply 50 people. We all wrote one article each, okay? Oh, wow. It was 500 words. You know, we had like a page and a half of contribution each. And uh, back in the day, we had people like Mark Victor Hansen and Deepak Chopra and many other names, that con Dr. Wayne Dyer, that ended wow. up contributing to this book. But even though I only had a page and a half in the book, when it was published, I could say I was a co-author. Correct. No doubt about that. Absolutely. And nowadays, it's not even difficult. Let's say you're not a good writer. You just go to Google Docs, press the microphone button and speak your book. I mean, what's the... And, and, for me, I'll tell you why I say this. When I first started, I was doing seminars and Macmillan approached me and said, you write a book. And I thought, me? I mean, like in my head, I'm thinking, I'm an English failure. I'm never going to be able to write a book. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. It took me a year and a half to write that book. And I don't think I saw more than 2,000 copies, if I, if, if I even remember. Can I ask you a question, which is, huh? one of the things I believe you tell a story where you, it was a turning point in your younger years when... When, when, when your dad said to you, you know, where will you be in five years? Yeah. I you just share that story because, you know, you've published a book with the same brand name, the name. Yes. Uh, but there yes. was a turning point, wasn't there, when you were younger? <clears throat> if you could share yeah. that story. Yeah. So, you know, when I left school, I was in a very confused state. On the one hand, I want to be a rich, successful person. On the other hand, my, my, my grades proved to me that I wasn't in, smart enough. So because of that kind of uh, conflict, I was confused. So my father came up to me and said to me, listen, doing what you're doing now, what are you going to be doing in five years' time? Mm. And I thought to myself, I haven't got a clue. Like, I'm talking about darkness. And that's probably the first time I experienced what I would stress. Like, you know, like, stress. And I realized from that day on that lack of clarity is the biggest cause of disruption in your life. Mm. So I kind of thought about it. What do I want to do? What do I want to do? And then the moment I want to think about what I want to do in five years, my brain will tell me what I will not do in five years and what I will, how I will fail in five years because I will in that way. But for me, that was a turning point because I like to see, I'm a visual person. I like to be able to see ahead. I like to see, the moment I see things ahead in my mind, I'm able to do them like that. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest turning point in my life. And what I did, to cut a long story short, from the age of 19 to 23, I ended up in 35 houses in, in north of England mm -hmm. uh, because I decided, you know what, I'm going to get into property. I got 2,000 pounds from my father. I put a deposit down on a house uh, uh, up north. And I literally played Monopoly because we played a lot of Monopoly when we were younger. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, you know, what the hell, let me buy the whole street. But that was a, a really big point. But having said that, a lot of, there was still a lot of negativity. It still is even now. It happens to me. You know, I, I, I now want to get fold higher. But your brain will always kind of remind you of what you can't do. So always fighting that battle. So, so with, with, that, with that clarity, you know, that, that breakthrough, in your 20s, heading into your 30s, at what stage, you know, looking at the jigsaw puzzle of different things that you did, 
yeah. to get to a point where it all suddenly came together? You know, you found yeah. home, you found yourself. Yeah. When, how did yeah. that come about? When did that happen? Okay. So what I realized is that I was trying to, I was going from one opportunity to another, trying to make money here, trying to make money there, trying to make money there. And I realized that I'm actually ambitious because my mission is to make money. And that's not really a mission. So when I decided that I'm going to get in the field of knowledge and transformation, that I'm going to do this until I die, I'm going to find a way to do it. My first 12 years were horrific in this industry. Mm -hmm. Everybody was telling me, you're crazy, it's hard, it's not going to work. But I stuck it out and I realized that the moment you find something that you are planning to do, mm. you will eventually succeed. You cannot fail. This is not humanly possible. Like, you know, it's like you want to run a marathon, right? If, as long as you keep trying, eventually you're going to run a marathon. So I think the biggest change happened when I actually decided that I'm going to do one thing. Like my brother would come up to me with opportunities and I'd interested. Not interested, not interested, not interested. And I stuck to this. And like I say, the fruits of your labor pay off eventually. And I think I just knew what I wanted to do. Do you think that was a secret, which was, and one of my favorite books is in my library called The One Thing, which is the ability to focus, the ability to, to really go deep into one area, and not get distracted. Yeah. See, I, I, I don't think it's a secret. I think everybody knows that. The problem is the distractions around you people are very easily pushed away from what they want to do. Like, for example, in Ramadan right now, I, I, I've decided to, I want to go on a diet. I want to lose some weight. Now, every time I go on a diet, my wife will come, oh, try this, have this, eat this, eat that. Now, I know what I want, but the distraction is there. So in life, I think if you ask 10 people, nine, nine people will know what they want. Yeah. But then they'll say, oh, you know, I can't do it because, because, because. Uh, that's why the closest of good people around you is so important that don't take you off track. And that one, so imagine thing, them, that one thing for you, was it, was it uh, being on a platform and inspiring people? Was it being a coach first? What was the one okay, thing? So, so I've, never, uh, I've never been one for fame. It's not, it doesn't really do much for me. Yeah, but it's uh, like, happened now, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's happened now. Yeah, it's happened now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the advantage of fame mm -hmm. is that it gets you into places that you can't get to. Like, for example, I... I've met some of the, like, I, I was uh, at the last cricket match with Sachin Tendulkar. I've met uh, Mukesh Ambani, Nita Ambani. I've met all, all these kind of people. And because when you get well known, people start inviting you to places. I've been in Hell and all these kind of things. But I just think to myself, I, I got on track mm -hmm. because I had clarity of focus and I had a good group of people around me. Mm -hmm. you know, and people that were better than me as well, people who I looked up to and people who were looking up to me. And the one thing that changed my world, I'll just share this with you because it's, I think it's really crucial, yes. is I, I've looked at all the most successful people I know and they have one thing in common amongst all of them. They are what I call focused out people. Okay. And when I say focused out people is that they're not selfie, me, 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 me. I want money. I want this. I want this. I, they create something for other people that as a, as a byproduct gives them a reward. Right. Uh, I don't know if you see what I'm saying. So, yeah, is, like, you know, that, isn't that true? The real, that's what business is really about as well, isn't it? It's like if you're adding value and someone likes your product or service and the service has been rendered, you all, money is just a mechanism, just an exchange for the value you've given someone. Yeah. Right. But the challenge is that most people go out on a mission to make the money then with the opportunity. I'm saying create the opportunity yes. that makes the money based on the customer or the client falling in love with what you do or what, or you as a person, look at, look at Steve jobs. Yes. Right now, Apple is one product, which is an iPhone. I'm talking about the phone business. Samsung has a hundred phones. Mm. Yeah. It does almost the same business. And I'm an Apple user. You cannot take me away from Apple. You can't. You well, can try, I'm, but I'm, you can't. I'm Samsung. So we've got a bit of a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right, there's only the one product and they've still, they still, I mean, I think, I believe, uh, I don't know what documentary I saw where Steve Jobs' ultimate um, sort of breakthrough was to say no to lots of things, wasn't it? And to focus on just the one product. Yeah. And he was a tough guy. People didn't like Steve Jobs in the workplace. I don't know if you read about him. He was a, he was like, even in my office, I'll be honest with you, I walk in my office, I'm not, you know, I, I have very high demands 
of people because I think they have capability. Like my partner, for example, mm -hmm. he joined me six years ago. He's a young 21 year old who came to work for 50,000 rupees, uh, about $100 a month or $1,000 a month. And today he's a partner in my company, him and his other uh, colleague. And he's got plans of making $50 million this year. I mean, how did that shift happen? Wow. So I think, can I ask you, you know, with, once you started focusing on the business started growing, I know your business model today has evolved a lot. You have two, yeah. was it two and a half thousand certified coaches around the world that you were sharing with me earlier? Yeah. 800 yeah. of them have published articles and books, which is amazing. You've got your yeah. digital uh, mastermind groups that are running where you're supporting thousands of people. You're still doing your yeah. platform uh, uh, programs. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things in the business book, but I wanted to ask you for the viewers today, with all yeah. the knowledge that you've acquired, all the programs that you've done, all the coaching that you've given, if you were to take your top three things that make the biggest impact on people, and you know from the, from the, from the yeah. past, over and over again, these three things make the biggest impact. What would those be? Okay. Number one, it's clarity. And I'm talking about clarity. Not that I want to be rich or I want to be famous. I'm talking about clarity in detail that if I was to get you a script mm -hmm. of what you've written about clarity, I should be able to feel what you are able to see or feel. Mm -hmm. That kind of clarity. Yes. Number two, my, my most important one of all is the ability to shift focus. Mm -hmm. Because... What I've realized is that as you're going down the road of life and you come across a, a hurdle, now you can try fixing the, the hurdle or you can shift your focus and shift in a different direction to produce the same result. Mm -hmm. So the quality of asking amazing questions to yourself to produce the desired result. So I, I give you an example. I'm very clear about what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, now, I'm, I'm running on this bad to do something and I come up with a big problem. Now, for me, to, maybe I can't fix that problem. Maybe I don't have the resources available, but I can shift my focus. Like, two, uh, example, two people go to jail, 25 years. One comes out with a bestseller, one comes out mad. Both people, same situation, different outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I'd say shift focus. And number three, I think, is that, like I've mentioned already before, but the most important thing to me is surround yourself with good people. Now, good people doesn't mean positive people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean ambitious people. Okay. It means good people. It means people that have very good intention, people who are authentic, people who will tell you the truth. Yes. Now, it doesn't mean, uh, so I don't, when people say good people, they automatically assume rich people. I, I never said that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying you could be rich, but they could also, they could also like one of my friends yesterday was uh, going to do a webinar for the first time. Mm -hmm. He rang me up and said, Arfin, I can't do this. I'm petrified. I said, I don't give a shit. Get on there. You're going to do this. And you've got to do it. He needs me. I can't. I said, I'm on the phone. I'm watching you live now. Now, somebody else may say, oh, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. But if you know your friend's potential, you may be a little tough with them too. Mm -hmm. So I think having a great bunch of people around you that are authentic, I think that's the word. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to my brother yesterday. yesterday he said, oh, I haven't seen the Reg forever. And the one thing he said to me was, you know, that guy has always been a good man. He's always been a good man. Mm -hmm. you know? And for him to remember one thing out from years ago to say that he's a good man, to me, that, that tells everything. Yeah. And that could, would you say that comes down to, we were talking about this before, the, before our interview today, it comes down to your family code, your values. In yeah, terms, the people your you guiding have. principles, what do you stand for that makes you good, yeah? So in my, uh, in my coaching program, the first thing we cover is something that I call baselines, right? What are your baselines? Mm. Now, some people may call them values. I mean, I'm, I'm talking even deeper than that. I'm talking about, you know, for example, if my brothers and sisters came up to me today and said to me, give me your checkbook and sign a blank check, I would do it. Mm. I wouldn't even question it because my, the way I've been brought up is that family is everything. Mm. And we're all, we would take a bullet for each other. That's how powerful it is. And it's happened because when we were young, we were taught to share, we were taught to give. And we did a lot of sponsored walks, charity work that my father would push us to do. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right. If you can get a young family, get a family and start educating their children about the realities of life and the importance of values and principles and codes and ethics. Yes. Oh my God. I think you, you, yeah. you build the most incredible children ever. Well, as you know, you know, with the work we do, that's, that's what we do with family businesses around the world. And we've discovered that 
the best time to inject the family codes, the guiding principles into the next generation is before the age of seven. And Absolutely. Uh, we've also learned and got over a hundred case studies that if you take your three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old with you to the office, or they get a chance to sit in your chair, they could be an observer in the board meeting, just listening to what's going on. Or uh, we've got examples of a grandfather taking their granddaughter or grandson through a manufacturing plant. Wow, very good. All these things have a positive impact into the subconscious of that child to go, I want to be part of this. Correct. I, I remember uh, one thing that I was, someone told me years ago, which I can't remember who told me. They said to me, just make sure that your child never craves acceptance. Never craves acceptance. Mm. And if you can manage to do that, then you will produce a wonder child. You will produce the greatest entrepreneurs in the world because most parents are always telling their kids what to do. Mm. And then the kid does it to get acceptance of the parents. Oh yeah, my, my parent loves me because I did something. Mm. So I think uh, the things that you're talking about, uh, I totally agree with all of them. And I'm a big fan of helping, you know, get, getting people to understand their codes and their wealth codes and their family codes. And engage because you're not going to learn it at school. Exactly. It's definitely not. Well, what do you learn in school these days? I mean, even now with the, with the crisis we're going through and people being homeschooled, I think the whole educational system is going to be disrupted for the future. As I told you, I, I've had kids uh, 14 years and I don't intend to send my kids to school. I don't think, I think I'm not going to do 14 years of knowledge that they're never going to use, mm. you know, because I rather, I, if there was a, a practical application school, I would send them straight away where they can actually learn something yes. because memory, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need men. How many phone numbers do you remember on your phone? We don't remember things anymore. We don't because we've got these gadgets yeah. that remind us of we, what the we're going to do. Name, I can, the name like, comes up on WhatsApp. We don't need the number, do we? <laughs> We don't need, exactly, exactly. So I, I only know my wife's number and uh, my mom and dad's number, and that's all I know. Well, at least that's a good thing because if you, if you told me that you didn't know your wife's number, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> right? but, so, so could I ask you then the last the last ten years is where you've witnessed exponential growth in your business? Okay, during yeah. that journey. You know, could you give us some insights into maybe again some of the challenges that you've had to grow the business, the multiplier effect? What, what's been some of the challenges yeah, yeah. as an entrepreneur? Okay, so I always uh, this may sound a little crazy, but let me be honest with you. If I do ten things, I'm going to fail in seven of them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do ten things, I'm going to fail in seven. So if I am in, so I I I'm in the field of transformation but I could have 10 different projects running in the field of transformation. So I'm not diverting my focus. Mm -hmm. So what you've got to do is that if you only have one plan and you're going in one direction with one strategy, there's a chance of that failing. So you've got to be able to have at least multiple streams that you're focused on. Mm -hmm. Number two is I can, biggest thing I ever did in my life is I stopped poking my nose into my business all the time. I started delegating <laughs> because yeah. I was involved in everything. I was, I'm, Everything. I didn't trust that people would do what I would do for my work. But then I decided one day that, you know what, I'm not going to get involved in this. So I'm now literally 80% of the operational issues and stuff. I don't even get involved in because I'm good at ideas. I'm good at creating business. And I focus on that. But secretly, secretly, are you still going, oh, I hope they get this right? <laughs> no. not, not, not secretly. I'm openly <laughs> going, oh. Yeah. But the good thing is, the good thing is, my team is, I've got, I'm very blessed. I've got the most incredible team in the world. And they know that this man will never, ever be satisfied with anything we do. So they, they do the best they can. And they're really good. I mean, they really, they work day and night. Um, I, I, I have to beg them to go home. And I'm not even kidding you. I've got to go home. So I've got a really good team. Uh, so I think having a good team around you, taking, keeping your eye focused on what you are good at and don't try to do everything yourself. If you don't have a team of people around you, Start a mastermind and develop a team of people around you. There are people out there that are desperately trying to get into great masterminds and teams. Um, and have your, have your outcome crystal clear. You know, I set a target you know, that I'm going to uh, impact 10, 10 million people in the next few years yeah. through these channels. Now, I swear by God, and God is my witness here, I've never ever did my business on the revenue I want to generate. It was more on the people I want to impact. Right. That will create me the revenue. It's really important for me to get that across. Mm. 
because otherwise, you know, if I start, what am I going to do with a hundred million dollars? I mean, to be frankly honest, I can do a lot with it. I realize that, but the, the excitement of impacting 10 or 20 million people for me is far, 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 far bigger. And if I do a good job, it'll give a drop. So struggles are, well, you know, manage your money. Yeah. I mean, we've, 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 we've experienced that with the wealthy as well, where when you really get down to the core, I'm not, there's always exceptions who, who will spend millions and millions of dollars on stupid things. But the, yeah, the yeah. majority of wealthy people and the millionaires and billionaires that we work with in family businesses, they don't really need much. I mean, if you look at the, the base level of what they require for their lifestyle, so you're right. It's not about really the money. It's for most of them. It's the buzz. Actually, it's the buzz of the buzz. creating yeah. something. What's next? Growing it, starting it, handing it over to somebody else, starting something sure. else. That's it's that journey that gives them the buzz. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I read a book one day. It said that the moment you hit a hundred hundred thousand dollars a year, the the increase in happiness, even to ten million, is about five percent more. Yes. I think what absolutely. happens is that you, you, you have an increase of choices. And when you have choices, you don't do them anyway. Yeah. You know, you can. You only, you only do what you only want what you can't have. And when you get what you want, mm. you tend not to use it. Mm. Like you put a gym in your house, you use it for a day after day five, nine out of ten people will use the gym. Because mm. we, we know we can. Can, can I ask you, Arifin, with, with if let's say this focus, you got this surrounded with the right people, um, you know, not getting distracted. It's all about rendering the right service and adding value. Uh, that's what your mission and vision, vision is based on. The money will follow. So, you know, the other things I was sort of, I'm trying to get to with that, 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 that focus is at what stage does the vision change? At what stage does, could the purpose change? At what okay. Stage, you know, have you ever had that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what I do is, uh, I, I have a, a, a process I call outcomes and mm -hmm. I have something called a power leap. So let's say, for example, I, my, my, my end outcome is to impact 100 million people, just for argument's sake. So what I've done is I've put these stepping stones, like a candy crush pathway. Right? I've got these stepping stones. <laughs> yeah. And all of them are achievable. All of them are achievable. Because what I've realized is that the brain needs evidence of success for it to think bigger. So now I say, okay, you know what? I'm going to, my, my first milestone is this. I get there. I acknowledge the milestone. My brain now says, wow, he's achieved it. Let's go to the next one. It's only human nature that if I'm climbing up a step, I'm going to go to the next one. If I can go on to the first one first, I'm not going to try to jump to the top step in one step. So if you, if you have short power leaps, small yeah. leaps, I call power leaps along the journey, the probability of you achieving your destination is fine. Now, you must have heard this a million times before, but I'm saying they should be achievable. They should be quite easily achievable. The more celebrations you have of achievement, the more your brain is. Now, if you told me 10 years ago that I'm going to be thinking of impacting 10, 20, 30 million people, I, I would have laughed. I mean, are you crazy? Mm -hmm. If I can get 1,000 or 2,000, I'll be happy. But the, <laughs> it's changed because I also now have a team around me that I believe can help me because I can't do it by myself. Mm. I've got the power of social media. Social media has changed everything mm. in a way that I can't even express to you. You know, because I've, I've been in the day. Can I ask you, if you with, with social media for a second and the learnings there, um, there are mixed thoughts out there of building the business. So some people will say, no, just build it one step at a time, add value to one person. They'll tell three people, you know, your business will grow organically over time. Then there's others that say, no. You know, you should be on social media all the time, five posts a day. You should be doing this. Your brand's got to be visible. Where, where's the balance between those, you know, those two thoughts? Okay. Two first ways of all, I think that, yeah. First of all, um, if you are not a social media kind of person, that should be given to someone else. Right. Because, like, for example, you know, I don't like, I don't like taking pictures and stuff like that. I don't, you know, I'm not one of those guys, but I have people who do that now and they take pictures. Mm -hmm. Now I have a, I have a very good connection with Facebook and they told me that you need to have at least 15 posts a week happening on Facebook somehow, at least 15 a week. It could be a picture, it could be a quote, it could be an article, it could be anything. So I believe that you should be out there visible. I don't think you should put rubbish out there. I think you should put content that is uh, specific to an audience that you want to, to attract. 
Uh, and it doesn't have to be reams and reams of content. It can just be, you know, cable Facebook Live uh, uh, posts. But the, the, it, and, and secondly, why should you not? Think of it from the customer perspective. There could be a family out there right now, Reg, yes. who is growing very big that needs someone like you to get their family code in order, their family values and systems. Well, someone like you, you know, where they need, they need to be part of a coaching program, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 if you, and if you're not visible, they'll never find you. And today, look, I started my work in South, I, I went to South Africa, never been there before. I, I, ran, I ran a campaign on social media, went to South Africa, I went myself, I love Cape Town, I went there, I did my first ever presentation. Hmm. And in the space of two weeks, we had 40 coaches that had registered with us. Wow. And I'd never been to South Africa before. Think about that. Now, why would I not, and, and something, the stories I've got from South African coaches, Oh my God. I mean, I cannot even, just an, just a hearing of those stories was, was worth, worth going there. And now I know we've got 40 people that are doing something with their life. I mean, you mentioned so, something bang on, I think, which is depending on, you know, you want to create things that are relevant to the audience that you're going for, whatever niche you're in, whatever you're, if you're yeah, all over yeah. the place on social media, one, that doesn't work. And I've also realized, I get your views in the last year or so that, there are so many different platforms now on social media that all of them are very different. You know, the, the Facebook is like, you know, the, the school reunion type pictures and that's where everyone responds to Instagram is all about beautiful images and people are right. that. YouTube is all about great content, you know, and people want to go back and listen to that content again. What do you think? Do you think each one has to be treated differently? Should you oh, use all of them or no, just focus yeah. on one or two and that's it. Well, I think uh, they're all different. Instagram has got a younger crowd, more visual crowd, you know, pictures and stories. Then Facebook is, uh, I think, got a bit more variety because you can do videos and you can do posts and you can do chats. Um, uh, LinkedIn, uh, I don't use much. Um, I think it's just good for recruitment and good for blogs, very good for the medium blog, etc. cetera. Uh, but I would treat each one separately. But having said that, if I post something on my Facebook group, like a picture, I do post that on Instagram simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that I've not taken advantage of, which I intend to do in the future, is Instagram and Facebook Live. Okay. I think it is, it is part of, if you look at Gary V recently, yes. he's been on Instagram Live every single day practically. And, you know, and he's another good example of someone who's pretty focused on what, he, what, what he's doing with his life in terms of his tribe. And he's, uh, he's on there all the time. He's banging out answers. He's doing, doing a good job. Well, I, I, you know, you've just validated to me because one of the recent interviews I, I, I just completed, you, you, you probably remember Ali Al Saloon from the UAE. He's a dear friend of mine, Emirati. And, you know, he's exploded in the last 10 years. He's now sold 1.5 million books, uh, wow. 20 million views through with all his content. And he's traveled to 191 countries with his work. Wow. And he Amazing. was telling me, that right, he, you know, he was basically advising me. He said, look, YouTube, keep doing what you're doing because people want certain type of content. And if they're loyal to your content, they'll watch it all. And he goes, but if right now Instagram is what's built his follower base because um, he finds the algorithm and short videos and live very quickly, it's all about the technology behind it. And you know, it's going right. viral faster. Anyway, I'm not a techie, so... I used to love your videos. The ones you used to do in the back of the car. You used to be driving around with somebody. They were good. They were really good. I, I think I watched every one of those videos. Yeah. Well, may, may, maybe, you know, we, we need to do more of that because I've always been a, a bit OCD and a bit, bit of a perfectionist. And what I've learned in the last two months is that's gone out the window because right now oh. you can do a Zoom a recording like this. It's all about, uh, uh, it's about the content. It's not how beautiful it, the audio people may, like the video may be. Yeah. People like raw stuff now. They like raw stuff. They, they want to see real stuff. Yeah. I remember once I was uh, uh, with Ritik Roshan, and if you know him, he's a very yeah. famous Bollywood actor. And I said to him, put your camera onto the treadmill and <laughs> talk. And he's running and he's doing talk. And, uh, and what came out of it was absolutely spectacular. Right? It was such a good, and I said to him, if you post it on YouTube, you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> of course, he didn't post it. That's a different story. But my point is that people love raw content. Mm. And I think, uh, and people also like a lot of uh, blunt content nowadays. I've realized that people don't want to hear this. Oh, don't worry. It'll all be okay. People want to hear truth. Now, I, I, you're going to laugh at this statement. I sometimes tell people I'm the truth coach. I show you your truth. And I, you know, and, and I think people, 
want to hear that now. They're, they're fed up of, you know, all this. And I, I, I also think, I think it depends on the audience as well. Um, sure, 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 sure. Some sure. of the, the chairmen that we deal with and people, we've got a sort of pro different private WhatsApp groups. And we find out that is the fastest way to connect with them, give them value. They love using their WhatsApp private group to, to see what's going on. They don't want to yeah, go on yeah, Facebook. Yeah. They don't want to go on YouTube. So I think there's so many different ways of doing this, but I know we're going to run out of time soon. I wanted to ask you a, little, a couple of minutes and we'll wrap up about the future. Sure. With digital technology, the, the coronavirus situation, pandemic this year, what's going on around the world, how do you see business models, business changing? And what, what are you going to do with your model for the future? What tips would you give entrepreneurs? Okay, so first thing, if you, if you don't, if your business is not operable online, if you don't have a model that generates some form of business online, you are in deep trouble for the future. Right. Now, I'm not being a, a, an angel of doom, but I've seen that that is a fact. Mm. Um, the other thing is this, is that uh, because of this virus, the level of trust amongst human beings is going to come down dramatically right. in, a, in, in a huge way. Mm -hmm. Having said that, there's a lot of possibilities now as well, because I don't know if people realize the impact of what's going to happen. The virus may have caused an impact, but the, the after effects is where the businesses are going to be hit. Right. So this is, what I, this is what I think. Number one, the education industry is going to completely change. Yeah. <clears throat> in a way that people will start doing a lot more virtual education. Number two, businesses will start depending a lot more online. <clears throat> uh, now with 3D printing and the 5G and 5G coming on, the speeds are going to be absolutely insane. Yeah. So your, your, your business owner has to find a way to take their business towards online. I, for example, I'm now shifting almost 70 to 80% of my business wow. through an online model. Now I'm going to shift it because First of all, I can reach a lot more people. <clears throat> number two, it doesn't, it's not dependent upon me. And number three, it's the future. Mm. And, so while I, you're, uh, while you're, and while you're talking about that, I'm just going to bring up you know, your, some of your brands again. So with, with like the books and the coaching program and everything now, obviously if somebody wants to engage with you, I'm going to make sure your details are in the description area and sure. those of you, you know, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share our video. So tell what? us briefly regarding the future with digital, what you're doing, how do people engage with your brand and your offerings? What are some of the things that they could do with you? Okay. So one recommendation I give to everyone, become a coach. Even if you don't want to coach people, become a coach. It will change your life and you'll be very surprised that you don't need to, uh, years and years of study of psychology to be a coach is a whole different thing become a coach and we have a program called coach to a fortune which is uh it is brilliant and the support structure is amazing right. uh, there's weekly meetings there's live meetings there's interactions there's assignments and we don't let you go till you complete it um the other thing i would say to you is that i i do a a, a recent new mastermind called apprentice millionaire oh, wow. um i've realized that if, if if people it's called the apprentice millionaire club yeah. Uh, and I realized that if people hang around with the right kind of people and achieve financial freedom, other areas of their life get affected automatically mm. and money is measurable. So we, we run weekly zoom meetings at the moment and they'll eventually become live meetings, uh, every single week. Mm. Uh, and I'll give you the details of that. Maybe you can pass it on. Sure, definitely. And, 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 and if they're interested, I'll, I'll also give you a link to a couple of webinars that they can attend and they can see what we're doing. Mm. I like working with, ordinary people who have big dreams mm. and people who are stuck. People ask me, do you work with people that have problems? I say, no, I work with people that are stuck. They want to fly, but they're stuck. There's a distinction between those two. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, huge. Distinction. People who generally have a lot of problems don't want to do much. About it. I've seen that people who are stuck. It's like Superman stuck in glue, mm -hmm. but needs to fly and wants to fly. And they need someone to come along just to take the glue away from the shoe. That's what I do for a living. That's clear. I, I feel, yeah. So I'll get, get me this information. I'm going to make sure that it's all in the description. And, I, and the, the thing I love about what you said a few minutes ago is the coaching program. I'm a firm believer in, I'm self-taught, went on some programs maybe 15 years ago. But if I didn't learn those coaching techniques, you know, I, 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 it's helped me become a better father. Yeah, it's helped me become there, a better right? husband. It's helped me with my clients. I think it's not just about being a coach for others. It's great for your own life. 
it's great to, to support your children. Um, so I really encourage, you know, make sure that we, we get these details okay. to them and, and they can find out more about how they can develop these skills as well. Okay, great. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank you. And guys, uh, you. I know you, uh, this is, I know this is Reg's show, but I would like to say that he's, he's one of the most incredible guys I've met. Very honest man. I just like, that's the word I want to use. I like, no, because I think there's nothing greater than honesty. I just think there's the best value that anyone can have. So, and I've seen you grow. My God, have I seen you grow? I remember you used to come and uh, first meeting you used to be wearing this green suit. I remember the suit as well. And used to be all polished up, perfect. You always dress really well. And, uh, and today, you're, you know, you've done really well. And I think what you're doing is going to will, will be very big in the end. You want to maybe look at that. Yeah, th I appreciate uh, your, I think your kind words. It means a lot to me and this interview. This was well overdue. And thanks very much for watching. We'll see you on another one of the episodes on the channel. I think God bless sure. uh, during Ramadan and then either the later on in the year and also stay safe and we'll catch up again and, soon. Sure. And you take care. Look after yourself. And thank you very much, guys, for listening in. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.